Okay, welcome everybody uh, to our panel of aesthetics. First paper is from Lorenzo Maranucci on Sabi, Fuga, and Irony, the Aesthetic Inquiry of Onishi Yoshinori. So, okay, I'm, I tried to focus on an author, uh, Onishi Yoshinori, who, although he could be considered a major, a major, at, at the very least academic, but also thinker in, the, in Japan, say from 20s to 40s, He's mostly untranslated, and there isn't, there isn't much literature, especially on this topic. So I'm trying to first introduce it, because it's, it has plenty of complexity. And then I will try to just add my, my own perspective at the very end. So we're, I will try to deal with Sabi as appearing in his own research. So if we ask someone foreign to Japanese taste to listen to Japanese beautiful things, we'd probably hear of cherry blossoms, colorful kimonos, and maple leaves. It would not be unlikely, though, for, for moss grown stones, the raw wood of a tea hut, or a certain hike about a pond and a frog jumping into it to get into such a list. This taste for the subdued, the withered, the forlorn, as opposed to things easily and more easily and positively seen as beautiful, that, uh, to, to use the Japanese expression, flowers and birds, kacho, is a particular aspect of Japanese aesthetic consciousness. Sometimes hastily explained as a zen, or zen as a Zen aesthetics or Zen influence aesthetics, it is more collectively identified by terms like Kotan, Shibumi, Wabi, but most importantly, Sabi. In aesthetic terms, talking of Sabi um, poses as some relevant problems. So, just to list four, if it is a uniquely Japanese notion, it is possible to make sense of it in interculture or universal terms. Some other authors, let's say uh, Kuki, when he, would, when he was dealing with Iki, he all, we said, no, that's, that might be the case for Sabi or not. And does Sabi as an internal structure, does it behave as a category? And reversely, in which extent is a specific understanding of it relevant to the general field of aesthetics from, from a Western perspective? And does understanding Sabi offer us something philosophically, something philosophical, even in extra aesthetic terms? So uh, this question already shaped Onishi Yoshinori's work on Sabi. Here I would like to concentrate on his 1940 book Fugaron, uh, mm, at first reason for this is that Onishi's reflection is still one of the most relevant original analysis of this concept up to today. Secondly, Onishi's work itself deserves, should, should, deserves a broader attention. It's up to now still effectively untranslated, apart from excerpts and a hardly accessible dissertation from 1948. And even if he attempts to present it, there's Michael Mara works a little bit on, on Onishi, then Ueda uh, wrote, um, wrote an essay about Yugen, and there's a section also about Yugen in the Heising and Maralda source book for, for Japanese philosophy. But all these con contributions focus on his research on Yugen and Aware, omitting this third aesthetic category. However, the idea of three particular Japanese aesthetic categories, Aware, Yugen, and Sabi, as instances of general aesthetic types, das Schöne, das Erhabene, das Komische, so beautiful, sublime, and comic, Develop or, develops organically in Onishi. And with a very close publication of Yugen to Aware in 1939 and Fugaron in 1940, and later the, the, the systematic expansion of Bigaku, posthumous in 1960, we can really take them as a unicum. Moreover, uh, not only that, even on the brute level of size, Onishi dedicates to the analysis of Sabi alone a book of roughly double the size of Yugen and Aware combined. So Onishi himself insists on how Sabi, with his contradictory appreciation of negative aspects of reality, is even harder than Yugen and Aware to grasp as an aesthetic category. Close quote. If we add to that the Onishi system, uh, Sabi is taken as a particular realization of humor, a concept that at first sight not only is very far from shabby huts and quite solitude, but also it's out of place next to classical Kantian ideas of beautiful and sublime, his claim does call for a closer consideration. So briefly, who's Onishi? Let us briefly repeat the stages of Onishi's formation. He graduated in 1913 at the University of Tokyo. In 1922, he started teaching aesthetics in the same university. In 1927, he was selected for a period of formation abroad, mostly in Germany, partially in France and Italy, together with the former fellow student Watsuji Tetsuro. They actually traveled together on the same ship, and they spent several moments of their European stay. Onishi stayed in uh, the German formation of Onishi, the decisive element of his production. Not only his writing has a dryness and a difficulty 
way closer to German academ academia than to the charming prose of contemporaries like Watsuji and Kuki. For him, European scholarship is, a solid, is always a solid basis to work upon, not an object of criticism, per se. It is striking to read at the beginning of a uh, text published in 1940, uh, already with the word begun, a very brief refusal of cultural exceptionalism. This, from the beginning of Fugaron, it is obvious that, especially in an age like this, where in the field of the history of spirituality and third, there is a strong current, current stressing what is Asian or Japanese against what is Western, the explanation of single phenomena and problems are not carried out with the necessary care, and we see a tendency to actually gather all these elements together by the elite Japanese character that we'll all share. But it's first necessary to differentiate them systematically, and through this, to ground theoretically the particular character of each of them. And here, that's a, that's a very strong sentence. To say Japanese aesthetics is just a provisional expression meant for simplicity of use. Theoretically, it does not make any sense. Uh, and indeed, you know, Onishi's doctorate dissertation was on Kant. He, uh, he, after he completed the first Japanese translation of the Third Critic of Judgment, and up to the late 30s, he really focused on phenomenological aesthetics. So, and maybe this shift to Japanese categories was actually accelerated by the very same wave of nationalism. So, Onishi's methods and the structure of Sabi in Fugaron, as in 1940. So, given such a vague matter, because it seems that Sabi is very all-encompassing, very special, it's a Ishin Denshin concept, but Onishi decided to observe it through its most distinctive artistic and theoretical expression, that is the haikai of Basho school, as a first step. Also because authors, the second re the reason for that is authors in Basho school that with Basho's teaching, not simply within poetic practice, but in terms of already close to aesthetic theory, in a way, non-systematic, non as Onishi often complains, but they were already doing a sort of aesthetics. Uh, Onishi also considered the aesthetic character of Haikai by itself as a very special form of poetry, characterized by extreme shortness, implicit meanings, a stress on objectivity, intuitive character, parodic, and interpersonal, an interpersonal mode of creation in Haikai no Renga. And then, as the core of the text, we get a fourth step in which Onishi clarifies three different meanings for Sabi, coming from two different roots. So that's by itself even even linguistically, even though Onishi is not a linguist, it's a very complex thing. These meanings are examined through aesthetic problems described by Shoman authors, as we will see. And in the end, uh, Onishi is able to clarify Sabi as a photo of humor, colored by a strong nature feeling and a metaphysical relationship with temporality. Sabi is thus considered a contradictory and yet essentially unified aesthetic category whose versati versatility line is keeping these tensions active as such. What Onishi does not explore in depth in Fugaron is how the notion of Sabi relates to instances of Western humor or irony, and if such connection would be relevant in a mutual understanding. So, let's pass to the three meanings of Sabi. So, following the Daigen Kai, the great Japanese dictionary of late Meiji up to Showa, a first origin of the term Sabi is found in the verb Sabu, to be desolate, rough. Derived from it are uh, first Sabuski and Sabuke, uh, two terms that literally means lacking of charm, to be unpleasant. On this level, the word has exactly the sense of anti-aesthetic. By contrasting with subjective meanings, we also find the adjective sabushi, desolate and quiet in an objective sense. The, the meaning of the first sabi, even the later spirit, more spiritual version of kanjaku or sekiyo, quite solitude, is essentially negative. So, second, <clears throat> The same word sabu, to, to, uh, in origin to be, to be rough, to be desolate, also uh, can be associated to characters la, such as ro, suko, with a sense of growing old, to have an old color. So the first meaning of lonesome to Onishi has a spatial connotation. It can be rather the detachment from, from a community or the withering, the growing, the, the getting colorless. But the second one deals with aging and temporality. According to Nishi, even if they are born from the same etymology, it is undeniable that an essential difference already exists between words like uh, sabu in, or sekiryo and the meaning of uh, ro, ro sukuko. Moreover, from the etymology of sabu also separately comes the term to rust, sabu, written with this other character. And thirdly, from another stem, uh, is the homophonic, but etymologically related verb saobu, to have the appearance. 
the the size, the shikari, so like nature, to 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 have to be surrounded by this appearance, to have the air of something we might have, we might say, as in as in Daigenkai. Saobu refers to qualities of resonance, resonances of things that exceed their objective, their objective reality in the sense of an essence. Uh, try, only she tries to link it to an essence of things. At the time of Manyoshu, example of sabis in the sense of Saobu, include Otoko Sabi, so to appear to be man like, to have the air of a man, or Otome Sabi, and later on we just find it though to, term, to describe terms, uh, um, atmospheres, that already are connected to the first meanings. So we have Aki Sabi, Okina Sabi, Kami Sabi. There's um, an example from Okuno Osomichi in which uh, the um, English translator uh, tells the shrine pre presence have great sanctity, but it's literally they are surrounded by a kamisabi. It would be like autos numinous in a way. And so we, that's already quite complex. And to make it even more so, we can we could say that actually it refers to different layers. What we what we see if we browse high literature, high show, we can see it's used as a predicate of real objects a particular quality of the verse, so poetry too has a sabi, or as the key to the quasi-religious life ideal of wind and grace, fuga, incarnate, incarnated by the figure of Basho. So we, we find in different, in different fragments, 20 years he broke his bones with the sabi of wind grace, fuga no sabi. And then, literally, the sabi of haikai, which is a, this general meaning of life attitudes. But then, also in Shiko, in Kagami Shiko, one of the form of theories of Basho school, Okashiki, that is comic, is the name of Haikai that literally has this meaning. Haikai means funny. But Sabishiki is the truth of the wind grace. And Sabishimi and Okashimi are the wind and bones of Haikai. This is a really perplexing, uh, it's a perplexing definition we will go back to. And it's a good thing for a coup to have Sabi, for a poem to have Sabi, but for a verse to have too much Sabi, is like to lay bare its bones. It should not lose its iron and skin. Mm, we just have the character for skin, but we can remember that even irony or sarcasm, it's hiniku, it's um, flesh and skin. So that's something that surrounds these bones, these weather bones. And later on in Kyurai Shou, what, what is the sabi of, of a poem? And Kyurai said, sabi is the color of a poem. It's not simply a quiet, lonely poem. So we, we can distinguish between three and often intertwined levels of sabi. Sabi has a wide and compassing aesthetic ideal, the sabi of the verse, discussed in conjunction with other ideas such as shiori, kurai, hosomi, and the sabi of things themselves. In, in this sense, it's almost a phenomenological notion. Haikai tries, and in this later sense, Haikai tries to capture things in this purely objective fashion. It's a, the self is bracket. And it, 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 uh, Haikai tries to get really close to very objective, intuitive expression. Could it be the uh, could it be um, could it be the case that these three layers and the three meanings of loneliness, old age, and appearance or aura, um, could it be that in all of them there's something isomorphic? That in the notion of sabi there's a certain attunement between all of them. Indeed, we'd face an aesthetic category every bit as important and every bit as complex as the contradictory insistence of Basho school on it suggests. So. <coughs> And in the last part, Onishi really starts to expand on that through this, through original haikai texts. So in the last and major section of the book, Onishi tries to integrate the meanings in a distinct whole, an aesthetic category. So it's a structure. The first one to be examined is that of quiet, lonely poverty, the first sabu. Here Onishi refuses, and that's, that's an important step, I think it's a, Onishi is right in that. He refuses to explain this aesthetic value reducing it to Zen-like spiritual experience, to the Taoist love of isolation, or to something akin to the romantic refusal of societal norms. Because they are all aspects of the Furio life, life ideal, but are not aesthetic per se, on a first level. We cannot think, however, that this moment, quote, quoting Honishi, we cannot think that this moment of poverty, fragility, unreal, um, unreliability, turn into an aesthetic category by becoming connected or united with some other positive aesthetic moment. They have to be, as negations, aesthetic by themselves. And on the contrary, it is in, in and through their negativity that thanks to a particular inclination of consciousness and of the subjective view towards them, they are turned into a sort of aesthetic posi positivity as an experiential content. 
So turning negative into positive while keeping it negative, that's a paradox. And things seen through the filter of Sabi become in a sense truly themselves, just as they are negated, like the widow branch in a, Bash, in a famous haku by Basho. But in searching for structural similarity with such negativity, Onishi points out that this oscillation, oscillation between positive and negative is what char characterizes at large an ironic attitude. For Schlegel, the first romantic theorizer of irony, irony is a bleak, a gaze, able to float over and negate everything. And not only this negation carries with itself a positive aesthetic value, even, even if facing the ugly, the, the, the wrong, the, the, the stupid, but it's somehow recursive, because in Lethe, reality gets negated by ideality, but in turn, ideality gets negated by different reality. Haikai is indeed, and from its very name, as we've seen, a comic verse. So it includes the parodic, the imaginary, the unreal. This is true for its context, which mixes the classic themes of waka with popular language and coarse material, and by negating them, discovers them in a new freshness. But irony is in the form of haikai too, because uh, as a poem, it's a short, very contextual, based on answering another poem on a sudden turn typical of jokes. Onishi recognizes in Kagami Shiko, one of Basho's most controversial disciples, a theorist of these ironic gates. Shiko's talk of Kyojitsu, real, unreal, is attributed in his Zoku Goron and Haika Juron to Basho's teachings, but in reality, collecting and editing Basho's posthumous papers, Shiko forged other texts, attributing his ideas to the old master. So he had his own philosophy and tried to project it on Basho. Uh, he, was discovered, he was already discovered by early Meiji Jidai. However, the notion of Kyojitsu, literally real and real, so real and reality or unreal reality, worldly things, poetic expression in Haikai and Haikai worldview, is strongly consistent with Haikai as a whole or as a form of irony. The, the 10,000 things of, the, of this word do, truly do something where they are in untruth. How could they act on imagination, on untruth, if they were real already? What is in truth stands in its reality, and man become wistful because of it. In Renga, truth means cherishing true things, being said for the scattering of cherry blossoms, feeding in the warning moon. But cherishing things unreal, that is the truth of Haikai. Haikai is the art of lying well, says Shiko in Basho's mouth. Saying truth as truth and lie as a lie is not Haikai's way. The true style, that's Basho style, Shomo, Shofu, plays between truth and falsehood. It does not rest on truth or false, on true or false. That is the sacred teaching of my school, says this fake Basho. Even in Shiko's definition of Kashimi comic and Sabi as wind and bones of Haikai, the barren objectivity of Sabi is not simply opposed, but related to the ironic spirit. And here, wind is also signified for irony, just as the French esprit or even the English spirit. Um, and so there's this particular wall of Sabi as irony. And secondly, Sabi as an aesthetic category, the rusting of time. Because if Sabi is a form of humor, then Onishi has to link that to the other two meanings. And the withered might be connected to Kyojitsu as an ironic movement, spatially, but Sabi as old age is explained through the temporal paradox of current and eternal in um, Basho school, uh, famously Fue Kiryoko, right? so the eternal and the current. To Onishi's word, withering or solitude was a sense of fading occurring in a spatial relation. This sort of Sabi is a visual quality. But instead, now in the case of the second sense of Sabi that is old, not only the problem obviously turned into a matter of temporal relation, but contrasting with the dissolution and the fading before, it is clear that at its root there is a sense of progression, accumulation. The accumulation of life is very similar to Duré from Bergson, even though Onishi doesn't seem to know him or quote him, does not make any sense in a word seen as pure mechanicism. It is a spiritual element in reality. Even the in in inanimate is engulfed, according to Onishi, into a fundamental atmosphere of human life. If you think of the old pond in Basho's most famous haiku, it's only it's in relation to us that it becomes so. Otherwise, a pond by itself couldn't be old. And so while an internal change, what does it mean for a pond to be old? And so while an internal change of life and spirit is recognized within things of nature, it is also a knowledge as a flow that very, the very change is a flow of consciousness. And reveal, contrasted to it, reveals itself again as a background to it, as a form of metaphysical stillness. Art faces a huge contradiction between the intuitivity of living experience 
and the, object and the objectivity of its expression, since both stillness and movement seem to be contradictory and yet essential elements of reality itself. So, quoting from the Red Booklet, Onishi puts this long quote, and I'm using Izutsu Toshihiko's translation, which is very brilliant at times, but not so easy to process. The Master remarked, development of heaven and earth is the seed of aesthetic creativity, fuga, wind race. As stillness is the immutable aspect of things, it is emotion that represents the aspect of a phenomenal evolvement. The flow of evolvement would never halt, even for a moment, unless we ourselves bring it to halt. Falling petals, leaves scattered by the wind, even the most vivacious of things will eventually subside to, dis subside to disappear into nothingness, without leaving any trace behind, unless we, in the midst of their actuality, arrest them with our cognitive act of seeing and hearing. This is a very philosophical rendition, far away from the, far away from the original Japanese. But, so, by themselves, constant movement and constant change disappear in an extra-temporal nothingness. And showing temporality in a hoku, a poem so brief and passive, this is in several ways similar to a snapshot, as, as Roland Barthes would note uh, further, further in time, is only possible on the background of such a huge metaphysical, metaphysical stillness. Infinite temporality has to be expressed through the moment and vice versa. Onisha explained this process with a very, with a wonderful metaphor uh, with colors. So to use an image, a color cannot be saturated in its hue more than a certain degree. However, if we put it next to its complementary color, its tone becomes much clearer to our own eyes. In the same way, it is correct to say that as a result of Haikai chasing purely its original artistic ideal through the unconscious artistic activity of its genius, it, it puts the actuality or moving experience of nature against its opposite extratemporal metaphysical eternity. So there's this metaphysical layer which is grounded in a deep relationship with nature. And Haikai is, is at its core such a contrastive expression. Such continuous discontinuity also exists in the polarity between even exists is reflected in the polarity between a single hoku and the flow of Haikai no Renga. It was a chain-linked poem. First a chain in motion, yet each of them is still an eternal moment. Is this metaphysical eternity of nature also a directly ironic element? We, we, we have to ask. As Onishi notes, all art is traversed by two contradictory instincts, a Kunstgefühl and a Naturgefühl. In irony, the opening to the external quality of nature is very limited, it's minimal. It's, it's, the balance of irony is almost only on the artificial elements of techno. To put it simply, we do, not, we do not laugh before sunsets. And yet seeing the old or the timeless, that background to the instant, allows to the ironic blick to acquire true emotion through this notion of love for nature and a new depth. So the aesthetic of Saab is then a very strange contract. We could call it an ironical metaphysics something quite unique. And three, the most complex problem actually, because sabi as an aesthetic attribute can be also something like color or air, because in this third step, Onishi tries to further connect the, this ironic metaphysics with the aesthetic essence expressed by Saobiru, Saobu. Remember that in aesthetics from Hegel to Vischer, an almost forgotten author that however has a strong influence on Onishi's work, a classical definition of beautiful was material manifestation of an idea Onishi wonders if the honzen, the original nature of something, is really what manifests itself in this sabi. Hegel noted how an essential difference between classic and romantic is that in the latter, even if its sensible fullness of, of the object and rich, uh, richness are corrupted and withered to a certain degree through the relations of time and space, it does not necessarily lose its, uh, its, it does not necessarily lose its aesthetic sense, and on the contrary, since the, this moment, transfer the weight of its, of its essential nature even more deeply in an internal spiritual direction, it makes us feel again a certain division between the essential and the sensible. So there's a, this negative essence. It does not belong to the object. It belongs to, it belongs to what is negated. What happens when the object starts disappearing? It's not there. If such an immaterial nature of things is not taken as an abstract, idle one, and, and she does refuse that, but something that exists within the phenomenon, or through the phenomenon itself, on an aesthetic plane of its partial negation, this tension and connection of essence and appearance is, to go to Nishi, the result of a certain sense of self-destruction and self-reconstruction happening, happening within aesthetic expression itself. Onishi gives the example of a withered branch of a plum that suggests the image of a jagged rock, and so it contradicts his own nature of plant, and yet in this romantic or ironic 
the, the two terms were already linked by Schlegel. This negation, we find the essence of plum in its nobility or the freshness of winter. Chico also gives similar examples of this nature of things, of this shikari. Haikai's shortness and elusive quality means that the word is given in terms of fragments. Sense, that is another key word in Basho aesthetics. Or to quote Onishi, that's another really strong image connected to the color before, like rust on a surface of a mirror. So the effect of sabi saobi does not rely on things as a closed, on things as closed perfect objects, but rather on their expressing this aura negatively. Uh, to Benjamin, aura was a layering of time and a sense of distance pertaining to objects themselves. They're being untouchable, not, not fully there in a way. And so negatively, emanating in a relative or empty fashion of color, since color is nor, nor belongs to the object, nor belongs in, to our eyes. It's, a, it's part of an atmosphere. In this respect, Onishi, uh, Onishi doesn't, doesn't connect them in this way, but another insight in this aspect is, that the, is the definition we saw before of sabi as a color. So in the, in the French translation, uh, Yame dit la patine, la pat, la patine sabi d'un verset, que sort de, de choses c'est donc? What, what's the sabi of a, of a verse? And the sabi of a verse, it's its color. And color comes, in its latent etymology, from celare, to conceal. And just as a coat or rust on an object is supposed to air, it covers and reveals at the same time. It does not belong nor to our eye, not to the object proper, but is the mood and quality of its aesthetic revelation. Kuki, too, in his 1937 uh, essay about um, Haikai aesthetics, directly links Sabi with, the, with this phenomenological quality of colors. That, that, that's a, another interesting level of inquiry. Uh, this relation between essence, both external and internal, was arrayed in Shiko's definition of Sabi as wind bones. Even, ever so often, in Basso's Haikai, the sense of freedom and exposure the ironic possibility of revelation and destruction is linked to an image of wind. The sense of sabi, more than essence, is color and coat or aura. Another word meaning air and color at the same time. Aura does have the double meaning in Latin. And that reminds me, that reminds me of another famous coup by Basu, which is that at the same time there's a lot of sabi and yet irony. Nozarasyo kokoroni kaze no shimumikana at at the beginning of Nozarashi Kiko, bleach bones on my mind, the wind pierces my body to the earth. So, a very partial and first conclusion. If this last meaning allows us to consider Sabi as atmospheric quality, that, that's what interests me. This could explain why the structure can belong to real objects, by, to the smell and color of a poem, and emanate from a lifestyle of aesthetic freedom, as furio, wind flow, or be present in the mutual attunement of a haikai session that Haikai described in Fudo, Watsuji described in Fudo as a form of kiai, breathing a chord as a static mood or atmosphere. Even if the notion of fuga, literally wind grace, gives the title to Onishi's work, the discussion on furu and fuga themselves in, in it is very limited. There's um, another major work about the, the two concepts, it's uh, Okazaki Yoshie, um book on furio from 19, 1945. So everything happens in this year in this year somehow. But uh, it seems to me that all these meanings, the special withering of bones in a field, the brief life floating of fantasy between real and unreal, the literally atmospheric rusting that gives itself to time, and the erotic quality of objects and poems, their being what they are and yet more, all, all meet together in the sense of air-like poetry. This is not to reduce Onishi's merit, obviously. It rather seems to me that the, the, his work on Japanese aesthetics does that a work, any work on Japanese aesthetics, does need to consider its method, that is, the trying to work in structural categories, universal, and, and his work. In both these senses, Fugaron, Astadion Sabi, occupies a central role that I hope to have at least introduced. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have quite a bit of time, as I said. Well, no one has. Oh, yes, please. I, I have lived in Japan 20 years and I heard regularly the expression wabi sabi, wabi sabi station. Mm -hmm. And I always understood it. I understood it like being in a, in a very simple house, uh, like a tea, car, tea house, with a cup of tea, the ones they have, the matcha, but very nice cup of tea. 
once we will go to repair. And so, amidst the very simple things, having something very nicely. What is that? What is that? We have to wrap the sun in that aspect of the old aspect, all the heavy quality. And the wabi is an outrage. Only she does discuss of the Wabi Sabi relationship. I, I omitted that for the 20 minutes and limit because also it's very hard for him. Uh, it seems, well, Wabi has its most typical dimension in Chanoyu, exactly. And it seems to Onishi too that in there the stress is more on poverty. That's embodied and lived through. So it's, it's not really, uh, Wabi is not so much in things themselves as in the, in the setting. It's a, it's a context is as a life form that would be really close to a even a Wittgensteinian life form, but in to Onishi also he's really willing and he, he does um, I think he has a point in that because in Wabi there's also an ethical sense so like to be happy to be satisfied in poverty uh, there's a hint of stoicism we could say and that's also part of life negativity. That's, so there's a, there really is an um, ethical aspect that brings wabi-sabi at one point closer to sublime. Because there's an ethical dimension not given into hugeness, but rather in face, in an ironic way. There's, there's a certain sort of smile in a tea ceremony too. Also, there's a pleasure in being together. But that's facing life's negativity. All the contradictions of life, including poverty or transcendence mortality, the, the, the fact of ichigo ichie, so it's not repeatable, um, it's there expressed, it's there expressed and enjoyed in an aesthetic sense, although there is also an ethical sense. And that's why Onishi uh, puts, does discuss about Sabi in the fourth section of the book, of Wabi, but also he does a huge effort because he could easily connect it to Zen on one side or to Chano Yu on the other, but he is really willing to discuss a sabi as a ju just or mostly on the aesthetical plane, because otherwise he wouldn't get an, a real aesthetic category. Just as, just as it would it would be fair to talk a sublime starting from just a religious perspective, it would be a correct but limited view. So that's that's his point, I think. Any other questions? Uh, first was very good. Thanks. Now I think that I understand Onisha, you're better. And oh, I have two questions. Or so uh, first one, uh, I would like you to talk about more about uh, the ironical metaphysics mm -hmm. that we find in Sabi and perhaps in Haikai, or if that could be a kind of Haikai like philosophy or something like that. And, and the second one is if you or me or Onishi himself see this, uh, how can I say, this uh, affirmation through negation in other Japanese aesthetical categories. Because it seems to me that Aware, Mono no Aware, also mm -hmm. has this kind of negation, but in fact is a uh, affirmation when you see something beautiful but that's uh, in way of disappearing and that's exactly this negativity that make this thing beautiful or, or have this uh, positivity. So I would like to just to comment on this two <coughs> things. So like ironical that. metaphysics and negativity yeah, in the other categories. Well, uh, I, he does, uh, I mean, I, uh, as a definition, as a poster word, ironical metaphysics, uh, he, d he does, of course, talk about metaphysical quality of Wakiryuko and ironic of Kyojitsuron. I put them together like, in one expression because it, it really seems to be there. Uh, he does say that, but it does, it's not, there isn't so much stress. When we talk about ironical metaphysics, that's very interesting because it's a, uh, it seems quite a, quite an interesting, quite an interesting line. We we can hardly recognize it. Can we recognize something similar in Western terms? 
And the, the funny thing is that, yes, uh, I'd say that if we think of authors, and uh, it's very unlucky that actually he takes the, um, the idea of humor from Visha, this almost unknown German art historian and literary figure that creates this, he's really working on those texts from the 10s to 20s. And Visha offers this, uh, das Schöne, das Erhabene, das Komische. And it doesn't seem to be so deep. Only she does quote Schlegel at the very beginning, but it's... Mm, I don't know how much she read. I don't know how much she read Schlegel, because it seems to me that if we talk about not humor in general, but the, uh, the, romant the romantic idea of Schlegel, of ironic, um, romantic irony in Schlegel, well, that's a sort of metaphysic too. And a comparison between the two uh, can be, could be extremely fruitful. Also Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard's work on the concept of irony and Lava, like more recently re rethought by Paul de Manders, there isn't so much in irony. So it's uh, one, one very nice thing, actually. If we go all the way to Japan, we, fa we found a very deep analysis that puts irony on the same level that makes a triplet of Schöne, Erhaben, Sublime, and irony. That's, for instance, uh, Kant does deal very shortly with irony in the Critic of Judgment, and he does actually give a negative. But it, it says, well, it's a great expectation that suddenly turns into nothingness. And to him, that's a minor point. If we think of that nothingness in a Buddhist term, that's a, as a form of shunyata, it's a, we could try to read Kant in this in the sense, and then it becomes a really strong point that he didn't realize in, in, in fully. So um, yeah, I would actually I would really like to, to keep to keep seeing it's uh, it's Onishi's idea with the uh, ironic metaphysics, and but I think he do, he doesn't go on the at least not in this text. So I'm, I'm willing to really read Bigaku, which is two volumes and even more complex. So I would I would rather I will try to look there in the 1960 Bigaku, uh, but I really think it's a good it's a good path. For the second question, you were of our and Jugend. Well, that's I tried. I tried to really limit myself to Sabi this time because the very few, the very little bibliography in English or even in Japanese about Onishi fo does focus. And yes, there's obviously a form of negativity in in um, in Aware in Jugend. I'd say, even if you read the Critic of Judgment, it's full of paradoxes. So all the, all the moments of the study, so it's uh, universal and yet subjective. It's without concept and yet it, it, it tends to a certain universality. Every, even Kant, who was not an author, fond, particularly fond of Aporias, just recognized that aesthetics is a middle ground. And that's even, that makes Sabi really interesting because if aesthetics, if irony, if aesthetics is a middle ground and irony is this back and forth, a brief like movement, then we see how actually, well, for instance, irony, Wabi is an ethical thing, but irony a la, a la Baudelaire, there's always a certain decadence. Uh, irony has this tendency to just destroy. It has this, so one can be, one has to be serious to be good. That, that's what most Western authors would agree with. And uh, irony has this tendency to, to put in, like, in this different light and is able to laugh at ideas. And so that, that makes it even dangerous. That's, that's why it's, uh, it's pushed on the side for almost the whole of Western philosophy. So, uh, so to answer your question <laughs> more pointedly, yes, obviously. Um, I will try to go back to Jugend to Aware and try to see them as a whole, also in the statics. Um, I'm, I started corresponding with Tanaka Kyubun, which is the, at, at, for the moment, he's the, one of the best scholars, I think, that is dealing with uh, Onishi in very good, very, very pointed synthesis, <coughs> this work of Bigaku. But I think that's, um, what I'm recognizing here is not just a negativity to Japanese aesthetics. It seems to me that this sort of movement, we could call it 
ironical, does belong to aesthetics itself. So in dealing with Sabi, and since it's such a complex category, way more than beautiful, in a way, because it's like finding beautiful something which is not, because it's not beautiful. Uh, and so it's like a meta-aesthetic, or it's a aesthetics squared. And that's, uh, I mean, even, even this, even in this presentation, I really tried, I had to cut a lot from Onishi's work because it's uh, 300, it's more than 300 pages uh, of a horrible, it's, it's, uh, it's very painful actually to read him because he, had do he doesn't have any of the charm of contemporaries like Kuki, Watsuji, later on Nishitani, they're very pleasant authors to read. He's, he's so bright, he's writing German in Japanese, and that's not, not a pleasant style. He also, Sasaki Kenichi in uh, Modern Japanese Aesthetics uh, in the Mara collection, talks about this style and points at this very fact. So it's, there's a reason why he's not so well read. He's quite heavy. But, uh, but there's an authentic intellectual passion. Also, I, I don't know how much, I don't know so much about his biography, but the uh, finding an author willing to say that talking about Japanese aesthetics, like to just project something on this Japanese essence, is meaningless in 1940. When even, I mean, uh, I have a strong intellectual respect for Watsuji and Kuki, but people that take issue with the culturalistic attitude do have, up to a point, the right, and in Onishi that's completely not there. So that's, that's something that has to be, like, like has to be at least um, praised for that, or respected for that. So I, I hope it was a useful introduction for you. Well, I think you gave a strong defense of Onishi and why it needs to be Well, it's a recent discovery. Yeah. And also, the Fugaron is... Um, I've, I worked on a physical copy I found in Kyoto, but um, the whole of the book is on the National Diet site. Okay. And uh, secondly, as I was working and working through it, I have around 20, 20 30 pages of translated excerpt, excerpts, okay. and I, so I guess they will be on my, as soon as I gather them more fully, they will be on my well, academia, sure. academia, <laughs> no, I, I would just like to upload them on the yeah. Academia Pontedu, well, because it's, it's not, it's not the, publishable as, a, translate, as yeah. a translation, it's too big, too complex, but at least in parts it's, it's good to have it, to make it available, I think. I so. That could be said about all the only text, I think, but, uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you very talk. much. Please join me in. Thank you.